Being directed by J.J. Abrams, this shouldn't shock anyone, but the 2009 Star Trek is exciting but isn't very good. But what if it was good? Could it check off all the boxes everyone wanted checked off and make sense and be an interesting new direction for Star Trek? The Romulan homeworld gets destroyed. This minor Nero wants to kill those he holds responsible, including Spock, who tried to save Romulus. He accidentally goes back in time to before the crew of the original Enterprise, no, not that Enterprise, went on their five-year mission. Nero destroyed destroys Vulcan to get prevenge on young Spock, who doesn't know who he is. The crew stops Nero from destroying Earth, and Kirk becomes the new captain of the Enterprise. Doing a reboot set in the same world as the world you are rebooting is an inspired choice. You get to bring in new fans and appeal to the Trekkies by saying this is a sequel prequel to the original timeline. Leonard Nimoy's appearance is meant to pass the torch, and you can't get mad because that old stuff still happened. That's a smart way to move forward. I just didn't like what they did when they moved forward. Even even if this is your introduction to Trek, this movie is still sloppy. What happened to Nero in between killing Kirk's dad and when Kirk is about to graduate from the Academy? Or has he already graduated? In Wrath of Khan, Savik was already an officer when she took the Kobayashi Maru, so maybe Kirk is an officer, I don't know. There's a deleted scene where Nero escapes from a Klingon prison to kick off the plot. That explains why he's out of the picture for Kirk's life, even if it doesn't explain how they got captured, since their ship looks bigger than the sun, and I'm assuming the Klingons would have taken that apart in 25 years and studied it since it's from over a century in the future. We should see an effect on the timeline before Nero escapes prison. The Klingons integrating this technology into their ships, something like that. They throw in a line that the Romulans were waiting for old Spock to follow them so he could watch them destroy Vulcan, but that doesn't explain why Spock, who immediately followed Nero into the wormhole, enters the past 25 years after Nero arrives. What is this, Tim Burton's Planet of the Apes? And why didn't Nero warn his ancestors their planet would blow up? You have plenty of time to evacuate. I get it, that would be a boring movie, but he doesn't know he's in a movie. Save your people, Nero. Kirk hasn't graduated from the Academy, I think, but after he sneaks on the ship, Pike leaves Spock in charge and Kirk as the first officer. What? Wouldn't everyone on the ship outrank a guy who doesn't have a rank? You can't ignore hierarchy because the audience knows Kirk is supposed to be captain. Even if Kirk doesn't have a rank, he was in the middle of a trial and was told to not go on one of the ships. In Wrath of Khan 2, Pike yells at Kirk Kirk for breaking rules, but here he gives Kirk a promotion. If it was me, I'd keep the idea of reboot via time travel and jettison everything else. Let's make the motivations of the Romulans more politically motivated. After the events of Nemesis, it's hinted the Romulans might have a go at peace with the Federation for the first time in Star Trek history. Some Romulans don't like this. Nero came from a powerful family in the Romulan Empire, and with the Empire's greatest enemies of several centuries, now allies, he no longer has a purpose. He tries to go back in time to around the time of the Earth-Romulan War and misses the mark, landing in the time the movie takes place. It might seem like shaky motivations, but Nero coming back in time to destroy every planet in the Federation because his family died is equally shaky, especially when that could have been prevented. How does Old Spock enter into the equation? He doesn't. The biggest thing Old Spock contributes to this movie is telling Kirk he is supposed to be captain of the Enterprise, and the only way to defeat Nero is for him to be captain. How does Spock know that? Old Kirk was dead long before Romulus exploded, so Old Kirk never battled Nero. Old Spock knows his own limitations and knows his younger self is not capable of doing what it takes to defeat Nero. Okay, but young Spock is the one who drives the little ship into Nero's ship, which causes it to implode. Seems like Spock didn't need Kirk at all. Get rid of old Spock. He doesn't do anything except give cheat codes to Kirk. How does Kirk become captain of the Enterprise? He doesn't. They should have taken this chance to boldly go where Trek hasn't gone before. It's clear their target audience were non-Trekkies. Since you've made an attempt to tell the Trekkies this isn't paving over the timeline they fell in love with, take advantage of that. You've destroyed Vulcan, so make the most of this alternate world by doing something new. Keep Pike as the captain. Eventually, you can promote Kirk, but build to that. Show him going from being arrogant and devil may care to the more reserved textbook with legs Gary Mitchell called him in the original series. When his promotion finally happens, it can feel like he's earned it. This movie takes place in 2258. In the original timeline, the original series, not counting the first pilot episode, takes place from 2265 to 2269. Nero's actions in the past have consequences. Now, we're dealing with an alternate reality where things happen differently. In the Prime timeline, Kirk served on the USS Farragut before he became captain of the Enterprise, but not anymore. That I'm okay with, but I don't think characters like Sulu and Uhura even graduated from the Academy until much later. Chekhov would have been 13 in 2258, and there won't be 13-year-olds serving on the Enterprise. If everything that came before is canon, take that into account before you set this movie in a certain time. Nero's time travel shouldn't age Chekhov 10 years. 
What is this, the X-Men movies? This is made for casual fans, but that doesn't mean you have to spit so flagrantly in established lore. Move this up in time, 2263 or so, then finagle the plot in a way so that most of the original series crew ends up on the ship thanks to Nero's shenanigans. Or keep this in 2258 and use characters from the original series like Kirk and let the whole thing be from his point of view, Scotty, whose engineering career began in 2241, McCoy, who was a doctor as early as 2251, and Spock, who was assigned to the Enterprise in 2254. Round out the rest of the cast with characters from the original pilot for Star Trek, The Cage, like number one, Lieutenant Tyler, Dr. Boyce, and Yeoman Colt. The Menagerie tells us the events of The Cage take place in 2254, so this would be doable. The studio would have wanted to give casuals a familiar looking Trek. You've never seen Star Trek, but you still recognize Uhura and Sulu. Even though it makes no sense for an adult Chekhov to be here, he's here because people remember him. But I like using characters from the cage and characters from the original series as the timeline permits. If you want to get crazy, kill off one of the characters we expect to live, besides Amanda Grayson. Give Yeoman Cole and number one even more presence in this new timeline. The casual fans won't care, and if you give a good story, the Trekkies probably won't care either. This movie tried to give every character something. Sulu has a fencing sword, even though using a phaser, a long-range weapon, would be more effective and less dangerous for Sulu. Chekhov beams up some people, even though I've never heard heard anyone say beam me up Chekhov, giving characters moments isn't a bad idea, but this movie wants to be a character piece showing Spock and Kirk changing over the course of the movie, but it also wants to be an ensemble movie showing all the characters doing stuff. Give some stuff to everybody, but not at the cost of losing focus on your main characters. I wasn't crazy about Spock and Uhura being a thing. Spock's thing in the original timeline was denying his human side. He didn't always succeed. There's a fantastic moment in Next Generation where he's talking to Data and he says, I have no regrets. Data points out that's a human expression. Spock pauses and says, yes it is. I like that. But it's a journey he has to go on. And sleeping with one of his students, that's definitely a human thing and not a good human thing. So no romance with Spock. But the executives are saying we want this movie to be sexy. So number one and Pike have a secret affair. It was hinted at in the cage that number one had a thing for Pike. This makes more sense than Spock being the bad boy. And I don't have much problem with Kurt trying some lines on number one and she's all get out of my face kid. Kirk has this reputation for sleeping with anything that moves, but if you watch the original series, he keeps things pretty professional, but you get to Wrath of Khan and he had a son he didn't know about, so I wouldn't mind a little of the Casanova thing. Cut the young Spock and young Kirk stuff. We begin in 2255 with Kirk in his final year at the Academy taking the Kobayashi Maru. That's a fun reference for Trekkies. Cut to 2258 we're right in the middle of the Axanar Peace Mission, which was mentioned a couple of times in Trek lore, but was never explored officially in canon, so I'm making up 2258 as the date for that. Kirk was on the USS Farragut serving under Captain Garavik. Things are going well, then Nero and pals arrive. It's complete chaos. Nobody knows what's going on. Kirk says Axanar is where he and Spock became brothers. I don't know if he meant this is where he and Spock first met, but that's what I'm going with. What if there are several Federation ships at the peace mission, including the Enterprise and the Farragut? Lots of explosions happen, Kirk gets separated from the rest of the Farragut crew, and he gets beamed aboard the Enterprise. We meet Captain Pike, his first officer is number Number one, Spock is the science officer, and Scotty is already engineer. With the destruction in the wake of Nero's arrival, Dr. Boyce will stay behind to oversee all the hospital stuff since he's the most experienced med person. A younger Dr. McCoy, who was stationed on one of the ships Nero destroyed, Dr. Boyce remembers him from when he taught a semester or two at med school. He recommends McCoy to fill in for him on the Enterprise until the panic at Axanar calms down. Moving Nero's arrival in the past fixes the issue of revenge Kirk doesn't have. I'm not saying he should be fueled by revenge. Gene Roddenberry's vision of the future probably doesn't have room for revenge, but Kirk doesn't strike me as the kind of guy who would forgive his father's murderer. In Star Trek The Undiscovered Country, he was ready to let the entire Klingon Empire fall apart because some Klingons killed his son. So if we place Nero's arrival in Kirk's adult life, we can easily remove what would have been Kirk's thirst for revenge, which is just as well, since I'm not sure when in this movie Kirk becomes so magnanimous. Nero's on his way to Romulan space to regroup with other Romulans and mount a large-scale attack. Nero has information on historical events that could come in handy to pass Romulans. Pike gets orders to follow that ship and stop it from getting to Romulus. The Federation doesn't know who that ship is, but if it makes it to Romulan space, the Romulans could construe that as an act of war from the Federation. Axanar is in the middle of Federation space, and Romulus is in the middle of Romulan space. A ship a hundred years more advanced than the Enterprise might have the advantage, so one of the Federation ships at Axanar fired on the hostile ship, and this slows it down just enough so it's a closer race. You'll have hostile between Kirk and the rest of the Enterprise, but it's a little justified since they all
all came out of a war zone where they were expecting peace talks. Nero ambushes the Enterprise, which they recognized once they saw they were being followed. This is their best chance to eliminate some of the fiercest enemies the Romulan Empire will face. Nero hails the Enterprise, he exposits some backstory for the audience, and he greets Ambassador Spock to young Spock's confusion. We get something like Balance of Terror, where everyone is surprised to see pointy ears. I won't have suspicion against Spock, or if I do, Pike and Number One can vouch for him. And then, but maybe you could explain this, Mr. Spock. After Nero threatens to destroy a Federation station near the neutral zone if the Enterprise doesn't back down, the Enterprise will be forced to fire on Nero's ship. Maybe he was going to destroy the Federation station anyway, go ahead and kick hostilities between the Empire and the Federation into high gear. They destroy Nero's ship, but somehow in the final act, Captain Pike dies. Number one will be promoted to captain, and while Kirk got off on the wrong foot with the rest of the crew, he acquitted himself well over the course of the movie, some of his quick thinking saved the ship, and now he's earned a spot on the Federation's flagship vessel. Kirk realizes there are no-win scenarios. He can cheat in a simulation, but he can't control every factor in the field. While Kirk is mourning Pike, Spock gets a chance to talk to him. You're the cadet who beat the Kobayashi Maru. Uh, yeah? When I designed that test, I didn't think it was possible to beat it. Are you mad? Quite the contrary. Anger would be illogical. I'm impressed. Spock relays the intended lesson of the Kobayashi Maru, but not in a patronizing way. In the original series, it was always McCoy and Spock who were bickering, but Kirk rarely had these flare-ups with Spock, which is why it was so confusing they had this animosity in these movies. We cut to Romulus, with a Romulan commander looking over the message he received from Nero before he went down with his ship. It's the historical information he intended to share with the Romulan Empire. Now the Romulans have a leg up on the Federation. Bum bum bum! In the movie, even though Nero Nero's ship is gone, they still left a big mining drill from a century in the future on Earth. So I assumed that would be something the Federation would study in between movies, but Into Darkness barely references the plot of this movie. But I should save anything I have to say about that movie for another video. Thanks for watching this one. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, I do this all the time, so check out the other videos like this. In the meantime, have a good one.